time once again for Community Forum. And we're very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Crystal Coop. Crystal Coop is co-founder and former director of the University District Street Medicine, also known as UDSM. Crystal, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. Thank you. So start out, tell us about University District Street Medicine and how it is that you came to co-found it. So University District Street Medicine started about three years ago. Um, it was when I was in graduate school getting my Master of Social Work at UW. And uh, it was a small group of students, medical students, nursing, physical therapy, and um, social work. And we were interested in seeing if it would be something that would be relevant to have a street medicine clinic, specifically in the U District, for homeless folks. We wanted to, we had kind of two objectives, two goals there. The first one was to actually give back to the community that University of Washington resides in. Um, and the second one was to provide kind of an on-the-ground learning environment for health science students that were interested in sort of working on their engagement and community building part of their practice. So we went to some community meetings. Um, we talked to different community partners in the neighborhood. We talked to current and formerly homeless folks um, about kind of what the level of care was that they needed, what was working, what wasn't. Um, we navigated UW, we kind of went through to the different uh, health science schools, there's six of them, um, and wanted to see how best to work together. We wanted to have an interdisciplinary clinic where students could also not only learn how to engage within the community and with the patient population, but we also wanted students to have a learning environment where they could learn how to work with each other. Um, UW kind of as a whole um, and healthcare as a whole really does a lot of focus on social determinants of health um, and uh, we want and on interdisciplinary work on being able to really be pa patient centered and um, work with the patient as a team as opposed to putting that task on the patient of kind of going to these different providers. Um, so we, we had lofty goals <laughs> um, and we wanted to see how, how that would go. We started out wanting to do kind of a traditional brick and mortar uh, diagnose and treat clinic, kind of a full primary care clinic, <clears throat> excuse me. But uh, upon further review, after we did some community needs assessments and talked to different schools and different street medicine clinics around the country, it was determined that the best way would be to start with a true street and community-based clinic. Kind of, uh, we were hearing from folks um, both on the service provider end and on the consumer end literally and figuratively meet us where we're at. Um, get to know us, go to where we're already comfortable, build relationships there, because there's a lot of mistrust uh, in the healthcare system. And there's a lot of mistrust in the healthcare system, specifically here in Seattle. Uh, so we sort of wanted to combat that by, you know, listening to the people that would be accessing this care and basically going straight to the source. So after about a year of planning and consultation and assessments in the community and kind of building those relationships within the community, um, we, our original model and our model that stands today is quite different. We are not a traditional um, primary care clinic. We have two community-based sites where we go and we partner with existing agencies to meet patients there kind of on a drop-in basis. And then we have True Street Outreach where we go in small teams um, and go and access folks kind of where, where they're at. We go to the library, we go to the coffee shops, we go you know, up and down the Ave there in the U District, we go over to the parks, things like that. Um, the small teams are small for a reason. One, they're, they're, they're a learning environment, so we want the students to be able to have that time to work with the licensed clinicians that go out with them on, you know, how did that go? <laughs> Was that comfortable? What worked? What didn't? Um, it's a very different model um, that a lot of students aren't used to. So there's a learning curve and there's a level of anxiety there that it's nice to have that small um, kind of supportive environment. And we heard from folks that uh, are accessing care come to us in small teams. Don't overwhelm us. You know, I mean, the stuff my nightmares are made of is like nine students deep going in with, you know, three clinicians and coming over this one person uh, and completely overwhelming everybody and not really getting anything done. So we kept it small. Um, we started our street outreach services in May 2015, um, and we continue to 
do street outreach and community-based outreach uh, at least once a week. And what are the two agencies you work with that are local there? Uh, we partner with Elizabeth Gregory Home, which is a day center for women and trans folks experiencing homelessness there in the U. And we also uh, partner with the St. Vincent de Paul Parish at Blessed Sacrament, also in the U District. So that's fairly radical uh, model to actually consult with the people you're going to be serving before really getting up to speed and finding out what they want. I mean, you wouldn't find an, very many other business models based on that. <laughs> Typically, no, and that's part of the problem. Um, prior to going back to graduate school, I was a direct service social worker for about 10 years. And uh, that was one of the things that I saw all the time, is that there were services being offered that were helpful and useful, but not community informed. Um, and there was a lot of problems in care delivery and outcomes ultimately. Um, because that piece was missing. Um, and I think also when you go and you actually talk with the community that you're trying to serve and trying to work with, you, that's, that's kind of an automatic way to start building a relationship because it shows that you have enough respect for the population that you're trying to serve to do it right. Um, and I think that that piece right there, that, that first piece of community building was really and continues to be really important for you, District Street Medicine, um, because we have uh, an excellent reputation in the community, both with service providers and um, with folks that access our care. Matter of fact, um, we have kind of been doing ongoing informal uh, needs assessments of the area to kind of make sure that we're doing the right thing. You know, is it still working? Uh, you know, sort of keeping um, real time track of what's going on in the neighborhood and what, what health needs sort of arise from that, what health and social service needs sort of arise from that. And when we first started our street and community outreach in um, 2015, we asked the questions of, you know, how do you feel about accessing care at University of Washington? And a lot of people said that they would rather not. <laughs> they, they had had, um, you know, poor experiences with different clinics. I'm not going to call any of them out, um, but they've had poor experiences with, with many clinics. Um, just because they didn't feel that they were listened to, they didn't feel that they were respected, they felt that they were judged based on their housing status, uh, among other things. Um, and then as time went on, and as, and as we continued to you know, become familiar faces in the neighborhood and, and provide that care with um, you know, compassion and relationship building at the forefront, we asked that question again about a year later. Um, and that was when we were looking into kind of expanding our services at that point, going into that phase two, if you will. Um, and we asked, we started asking people, you know, if U District Street Medicine were to expand our services and open a clinic, say, in partnership with an existing UW clinic, would you go? And a year later, we were getting a resounding yes. And, uh, and kind of a specific yes on, oh, well, if U District Street Medicine does it, yeah, we would go to that. And I think that's a big deal. And I think that started, uh, I, I think that kind of growth into a positive relationship started because we asked the source from the beginning and we just never stopped. So that was a year later in, which would be middle of 2016. So where is U District Street Medicine as of today? As of today, it's still operating. Um, I was on a temporary one-year contract for 2016, which ended January 3rd of this year. Um, and I was the sole staff support for that project. I'm also the founder, so I'm kind of the resident historian too, uh, which has proven to be helpful over <laughs> the last few years. Um, and so my contract is done. Uh, so right now the project is all volunteer. It's, it's students that are volunteering their time. Um, some students get ac academic credit, but, some, but most don't. So these are students that already have a full-time course load. I mean, these are students that are training to be doctors and nurses and social workers. That's, that's a big deal. That's a lot of, um, that takes a lot of capacity. So these are students that are sort of giving really their last, literal last few hours of free time to, um, to this project because they, they believe in it. Same with faculty. Um, there's no real designated faculty or paid faculty um, 
supporting this project. We, we do have a number of supporters that are volunteering um, in a faculty way. But again, um, they all have full-time jobs. They all have other things going on as well. So they're devoting the last few hours of time. Um, so capacity has dropped dramatically since January 3rd. Um, and uh, our funding is, is precarious at this point. We, last year, the temporary funding that I had was for my salary. Uh, we did not have an operating budget. We've never had an operating budget. We rely on student energy, community energy, donations. Um, but as far as, uh, you know, the financial side of things, we, we, don't, we don't have financial support. Um, we do have some potential options for the coming year but it is unclear on whether or not those will come through and be able to support uh, the project in, in a financial way. So University of Washington did some financial support for you um, for last year, is that correct? Yes, University of Washington um, for 2016 uh, put together a temporary one-year contract for, for my salary, for solely my salary. And that came through the Department of Community Engagement and Relations on Upper Campus um, and a small contribution from the School of Social Work as well. Uh, that was, at, at, when my contract started, I was told that that was going to be one year temporary and there was not going to be any change um, with that. And that ended up being true. Uh, we did, I, I was also at the beginning of my contract tasked with finding funding for the following year. Um, and that proved to be a challenge. Um, there was the first handful of months of early 2016 of sort of navigating UW and kind of figuring out, uh, you know, in, in this what they call a centralized, decentralized funding system, um, finding who has authority to raise funds, how you go about raising funds, what is the protocol. Um, that was a pretty tangled nest to untangle uh, and it took about three months to kind of figure that out. Uh, midway through the year, we started kind of pushing forward to funding to sort of meet that fiscal year for last year. Uh, and right around that time, we were told that we were not doing it according to protocol and we needed to stop, um, we needed to stop our, our funding processes at that point. So after that, what we did is we went back to UW and said, okay, well, you know, I said, my contract is done in six months. It's going to take a little longer than six months to sort of untangle this particular situation. Um, would it be possible to, to fund us for another year or at the very least another six months just to get us to the next fiscal year? So we have that capacity to keep pushing forward on funding. Um, it took about three months. We presented to the Health Science Board of Deans uh, back in August, and we're supposed to get an answer in September, and ultimately didn't get an answer until November, and the answer was no. Um, so we're kind of back in the same boat that we were this time last year on figuring out where, where the project lives um, within the UW infrastructure and, and how we can continue to find ways to support it either internally or externally. At this point, um, I, 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 don't, I don't know how they're going to do. And didn't the University of Washington just uh, begin hosting Tent City 3 at their facility? It seems odd that they would cut off funding for your program and then start a new program. Not you know, with a, with a university that's so well endowed that it would appear that they could handle both. Yes, this this is the question that I wish I had an answer to, <laughs> on why these two ships are passing in the night, um, because the start of winter quarter, which was the start of U UW hosting Tent City Three for the quarter, was January third, and that happened to be my last day. Um, so it really was two ships passing in the night um, on. On, on a topic, on, on an issue that is really current and relevant here in Seattle, really current and relevant in the U District, and very relevant at University of Washington. Um, so, so it is a bit uh, ironic and strange that um, they are supporting Tent City in the way that they are um, while not supporting existing projects. Um, I, th I think it's kind of that classic reinventing of the wheel. Um, it's, it's a strange way to do it. And uh, 
I'm curious to see what UW's commitment to the homeless population and, and issues around homelessness, um, both on a social and medical level, will be after Tent City 3 leaves in March. We're also, of course, looking at the university district, which is facing a major gentrification coming from both the city as well as UW, each having their own plans for um, bringing in a phenomenal amount of, uh, of higher rise buildings and, and associated people with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, what, uh, what have other, I know your original model was based, I believe, on this Detroit street medicine. Mm -hmm. um, have there been other universities that have done similar projects to yours? Yeah, there, there are. Um, and that's another thing that's interesting about kind of where this project is at. Um, we, we made contact in that first year and, and, and kept contact and kept building contacts over the last three um, with multiple street medicine projects. Uh, there's the street medicine model that is not uncommon. Um, on a national level. There are many street medicine projects all over the place, Detroit Street Medicine being one, Street Medicine Kansas City. Um, I mean, there's an international, international Street Medicine Institute. I mean, these are all over the world as well. Um, and then there's kind of the, the, the subtype, if you will, of a street medicine learning clinic in a university setting. Um, Franklin Rosalind has one, UC San Diego has one, uh, Vanderbilt has one. There are many, many schools that have it. And that was another kind of trying thing with this. Is this, this was not, you know, a couple of students that had a radical idea and wanted to see if we could shake up UW. I mean, that was part of it. <laughs> um, but this, this model and ultimately the model that U-District Street Medicine is, is backed in research and is backed in um, support and consultation from other uh, street medicine projects, both academic and non-academic all over the nation. Um, and that's, that is something that students, I mean, on the, on the community level, it's, it's, it's obvious in a lot of ways why that is important. Um, you know, engaging with the community that you're in is always a positive thing to do for, for yourself and others. Um, but this, this is something that students gravitate to as well um, as a learning experience. What I heard from students for uh, the three years that I was with you, District Street Medicine, was that they wanted, there were two things that they were really, they really felt that they were lacking in their curriculum. And one was the hands-on experience, the actual kind of learning by doing, um, and, how, and learning in that supportive environment, um, you know, kind of learning in real time, essentially. Uh, and then there is the piece um, on kind of the, the, the relationship building and bedside manner. Uh, there's a lot of focus, as there should be, there's a lot of focus in curriculum on sort of the technical aspects when you get into health sciences, which is important. Um, you know, this is healthcare. These, this, these are people. You want to make sure that you're not going to, you know, hurt somebody <laughs> in a technical way. But there's a lot of, um, there's, there's not a lot of focus on being mindful of not hurting people in a relational way. And students really wanted that. You know, they, they weren't feeling across the board in the health sciences, um, in, including social work, which is usually us as social workers, that's usually relegated to us. Like, oh, well, that's a social worker's job to kind of build those relationships and, you know, do that support and do that sort of navigating type thing, which is true. That is part of social work, but that really is part of healthcare. Um, so when I was hearing from students that this is not what they're getting, in their curriculum and when I was hearing from social work students that this is not what they're getting in their curriculum um, that was really a call to action for us um, because I because I personally think that you know having a trusting compassionate and real relationship with your health care providers um, increases your positive health outcomes and that that is my opinion but that opinion is also backed in research. Again, you look into social determinants of health, um, you look into health outcomes, and there, there are direct connections between relationships with providers and their patients and, and those positive outcomes. So, it, yeah, it seems that instead of uh, defunding or not renewing the funding for your program, that it would be 
especially appropriate in this time and the climate here in both nationwide and in Seattle especially that this would actually be instituted as like as a premier program at the UW. I could see this as a um, as a degree, street medicine, you know, mm-hmm. potentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and we we were in the process last year. We were in the process of building that out. Um, U District Street Medicine was a practicum or internship site for both graduate and undergraduate public health and social work students, and those practicum students loved it. Um, with U District Street Medicine being a kind of a new startup sort of fledgling project that didn't really have a home, there there were some you know negative and challenging aspects to that, but there was also tremendous learning opportunities for that. There was, because we had students um, both on practicum or internship track and, and volunteer that wanted that relationship building, direct service experience, and they got it. But there was also students that were interested in more administrative um, kind of navigating bureaucracy type skill building opportunities and U District Street Medicine is is definitely that you know kind of pushing uh, a, a different culture and a different agenda forward and it, it was a tremendous learning opportunity for students to be able to navigate that um, I think if we had uh, continued support we'd be able to build that out uh, more Uh, One of the things that the project is working on now is opening a pro bono physical therapy clinic. Uh, Again, with our real-time needs assessments that we've been doing over the last year and a half, almost two years, being out on um, outreach, we saw, and and this was something, this is something that has not been explicitly stated in different places that are providing health care, even in Seattle, Um, physical therapy. You know, it's kind of a practical thing. Um, is, you know, if you're sleeping outside and you're sleeping on the ground and you're carrying all of your possessions on your back and so on and so forth, that's going to wreak havoc on your body. If you're sleeping in this cold weather, you know, it's going to wreak havoc on your bones. Um, So through the, the, again, the relationships and kind of the real-time needs assessments that we've been doing, um, we saw that this was a very pressing need. Um, And we have an enthusiastic backing from the rehab medicine department uh, for that expansion. So that is, and, and we're, we're planning to partner with Christ Episcopal Church there in the U District for that. So again, keeping that community um, focus and keeping it in the community and working with existing partners that have relationships. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to see that thrive. Um, and another thing we could build off is those practicum opportunities. Uh, again, social work and public health students uh, had the opportunity to do that in the last year. But this could be a clinical rotation site for, for any of the schools if we were able to um, be supported in that expansion. Do you have a sense for how many uh, students at University of Washington are homeless? I, I remember hearing that a, a year or so back, and it was actually a phenomenally high percentage. Um, I was shocked, but I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. You know, I can't remember what it is either, but I know it is pretty high. Um, I think that's going to get higher as uh, the gentrification in the U District continues, um, as, as the upzone continues. I think a lot of students are going to struggle with that um, because a lot of the larger houses and things that are in the U District are going to go away. Um, we're already seeing that. And the, the, the rent is going to be um, unaffordable. It already is. Uh, that was another great thing about U District Street Medicine is we attracted students that had experience with homelessness, either currently or in the past. I'm one of them. Um, and it was it was a gift to the project and it was a gift to those students. Um, it was a gift to the students because they felt like they had a home. Um, you know, the university, while it is, there is a large number of homeless students, that's not, it, in, in the grand population of the UW student body, it's small. Um, and then with continued stigma around homelessness, especially in an academic setting, um, you know, it's not something that you necessarily uh, shout out on your first day of class or anything. So, you know, it's folks that are kind of not um, struggling to find a home in an academic setting. And U District Street Medicine was great on the relationship building side of that. Um, so, yeah, I, hmm, I'm sorry, I'm getting nostalgic here about, you know, how, 
how, how, how we made a difference at University of Washington um, and, and how we did help certain homeless students. Because again, I, I, had, a, I had a student who was formerly homeless who told me, you know, this, this is the first place that I felt comfortable at since I've been at the university. Um, and that was a big deal because, you know, that, that felt good for us as a project to be able to provide that support in an in internal way and in, 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 you know, uh, with the student body. Um, but what she brought and what other students brought that had experience with homelessness was uh, a different level of compassion and a different level of work. Those were the students, you know, we didn't just learn from faculty. We didn't just learn from community. We learned from our students, too. And those students that had that experience um, were a tremendous asset to the project and the other students learning, but they were a tremendous asset to the community too because they, they got it and they were able to connect quickly and were able to pass on how, how to do that. And that's what's neat about these academic settings or, or having a street medicine clinic in an academic setting is you know some of these students will graduate and they'll stay here in Seattle and they'll do great work here. Other students will go across the country or they'll go, you know, to another part of the world. But, you know, the, the education and experience that they received at U District Street Medicine on that community level is something that they can take anywhere. So this, this, this is an opportunity not just for healthcare in Seattle or not just for University of Washington, but this is an opportunity uh, that really knows no bounds. Yeah, it sounds like amazing work that you're not only healing those helping to heal those on the street healing those who are involved but healing the rift between those who live on our streets in the university district and the university of washington it seems like a win-win um we are pretty much out of time how can people find out more about university district street medicine and uh, support your your work Sure. Um, we do have a website. It's udstreetmedicine.com. Um, we are also on Facebook. We right now are uh, housed in University of Washington Department of Medicine through the Service Learning Department. So you can contact the Advancement Department there at Service Learning in UW Medicine. You can donate there. Um, and uh, the best way to contact us is via email at udsmvolunteer at gmail.com. All right. Well, with that, we're unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you very much for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thank you.